Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, that was a good, solid good morning. Good morning. Love that. Welcome to St. Luke Lutheran Church. If there's any new folks here today, my name is Pastor Eric Hansen. If you're new, we're very happy you're here, too. Um, also, if there's new folks, you see a bunch of people wearing gray shirts like this today. We don't do this every Sunday. Um, but today is a special kickoff for our capital campaign that we're launching to fulfill our congregational mandate and call from the Spirit to build our new church over on the corner of 6 and 9. So thank you all for being here today to celebrate that. One of the themes for the day is that the building, or sorry, the church is not the building, it's the Your previous pastors have instructed you well. In, in uh, the New Testament, the Greek word for church is ecclesia, which literally means gathering. And in the, after a while in English, it started to sound like church. How they got church from ecclesia? I don't know, but eventually we did. And so we remember today the church is not the building, it's the? Awesome. And we're going to build a new tool of ministry for the? People. You guys are awesome. Um, so that's how we're going to start. Also, I wanted to uh, mention we have some wrestlers who have achieved some awesome things. And if you know them here in, in, at St. Luke Lutheran Church, you can, you can tell them, good job. Um, we have three wrestlers going to state, the state 1A meet. That's Lucas and Ryan Bortz and Maddox O'Reilly. And we have two wrestlers who, were, who, were, who were placed on the podium yesterday, and that's Ethan Brewer and Mason Taxdahl. If you know them, you can embarrass them by telling them they did a very good job. Oh, and Lucas Erickson. Oh, Lucas did too. I didn't know that. Is Lucas here? Good job if Lucas did too. Lucas Erickson also placed on the podium too. Um, finally, a few folks have asked me what can be done to support what's happening in the Ukraine right now, to support the women and children and refugees because of that conflict. You can, a really good place to, to go to support folks who are in conflict situations, especially the innocent who are refugees and have lost homes and whatnot, is Lutheran World Relief. Go to lutheranworldrelief.org and you can find ways to donate. Lutheran World Relief is awesome because 99%, if I remember right, of the donations they get do not go to overhead for the running of the organization, but to the place in need. So Lutheran World Relief. I'll try to remember to put that up on Facebook today, too, for those who have asked. Let's pray and gather our hearts and minds in the right place for worship today. The Lord be with you. Father, we, we are people who always live with, with life and transition and even death all in our hands at one time. Oftentimes, funerals and births are celebrated in the same month, weddings and memorial services in the same year. Today, we get to celebrate the building of a new tool for ministry in Goodhue while we know that there is massive conflict in our world too. And we, we pray that this little movement in your kingdom, this little, little seed planted here, can be part of the way that you grow fruits of faith and hope and love and peace in good hue and beyond. That, that in doing this, we can play our little part. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. First today, I invite Larry Miller up for our temple talk. Larry? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is truly an exciting day for Saint, our St. Luke's family, for today is Launch Sunday. Pastor Eric has asked me to elaborate about our Forward in Faith campaign and Launch Sunday and what this season means to me. When I asked Pastor Eric how long I could talk, he was not very specific. And since I talk first, he will either have to shorten his sermon or you will all be wishing and dreaming that you are sitting in our new, soft, padded seats of our new church. <laughs> Before I get started on our main subject, Forward in Faith and Launch Sunday, I would like to briefly re-examine our decision to build a new church versus remodel our present church. Some ongoing issues that are solved by building our new church will be we have a structural integrity issue going on within a roof and wall assembly, as well as a water issue in our present basement. The classroom space, as you know, is very crowded, and the fellowship area is not very efficient. 
and we have a major handicapped accessibility issue. We have church members who have a difficult time dealing with these handicapped issues, or worse, are unable to participate and enjoy the mutual benefits of being with us, our church family. And we can talk about parking issues, but I don't believe we need to elaborate about anything on there. And if you have any more questions, the building team will be available after service to answer any of these questions, or you can call me direct and I will send you to someone who can answer those questions for you. With the decision to build a new church comes the responsibility of seeing and living within a much bigger picture. I believe Pastor Eric captured the essence of our responsibility very well when he wrote in his February newsletter. Pastor wrote, We are tasked with the responsibility of remembering along the way that the point of building a new church is not to add a new edifice of stone, brick, or wood to the world. It is to create a new tool for spreading the Word of God in our community, for being the hands and feet of Christ in our community, and for creating a space where all people can come together in holy relationship, end of quote. In short, this new church is a building to be used by you and I for the ministry of God. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about Launch Sunday and what it means to me. So what is today Launch Sunday? Launch Sunday today is a key component in our Forward in Faith campaign. It is a formal start of our financial campaign to raise money for the construction of our new church home. It is part of a big, all-encompassing story of God's work through us. This story is made up of thousands of smaller stories that complement the big picture. These smaller stories are our stories, our legacy, our contributions. I liken it to the big glass stained window, such as the one we have above our altar. Each small little piece of glass could represent one of us, a small piece within a big picture. When each piece is in place working together, a beautiful picture or story emerges. It is the same with us and how we work together in St. Luke's. We are all part of the legacy of St. Luke's from the person who sweeps the floor, welcomes somebody with a smile, holds the door open, Fills a, pew during sort, fills, fills a pew during service to the most recognizable people. We are all part of the big picture of St. Luke's. And it is easy for envision, excuse me, it is easy for me to envision the excitement of when our new church becomes reality. But I also can envision 20, 40, 60 years from now when our families, perhaps our children, grandchildren, or great-grandchildren are sitting in our no longer new church, watching their children learn and grow as children of God, where baptisms, weddings, funerals become part of their story or legacy, where there's room for fellowship, accessibility for members who can no longer run and jump like deer, or may even need a set of wheels to get around. Our legacy or our contributions, what we do in our lifetime will continue to influence and be the tools of Jesus as he continues his ministry. I ask all of us prayfully consider our roles in the building of our new church. We need prayers, physical involvement, and monetary gifts, all working together to make this St. Luke's building a reality. In other words, we need everyone, and everyone needs each other. Thank you for your participation in this process. May God continue his great work through us. And I would like to also thank our church family members who have already stepped forth in faith to start our pledge drive. As we discussed pre on previous occasions, we have a goal of $1 million to fund our Forward in Faith program, our new church. And I am happy, so extremely happy, to report to you that at the present time we have collected over $450,000 towards this goal. You look, you can see it right here. We're basically halfway there, and we really haven't formally started. Excuse me? In pledges, excuse me. Yes, a little clarification there. These are pledges. Uh, they aren't, there's not $450,000 sitting in someone's wallet. These are in pledges that will be brought forth in the next three years on there. Thank you, Pastor. 
Thank you for your cooperation and generous giving. Everyone, and it's been, everyone has been so willing to respond with excitement and financial gifts. It has made our job, the financial team referring to it, almost fun. It has been basically just an extremely fun time to be here doing a job that we've been doing, and I really thank all the financial team, but more importantly, I thank each and every one of you that have contributed. And I want to emphasize that these donations, these pledges, are above and beyond the present weekly offerings. As you know, the weekly contributions are used for the maintenance and programs of our present church. They cannot, they will not be used to fund our Forward in Faith program. So what does Launch Sunday Forward in Faith look like moving forward? Today, we invite you to take a campaign brochure and a prayer booklet home with you. You will find some information on our new church as well as prayer devotions to guide us through the next six weeks. Today, after service, we invite you to visit with the building team, church council, and finance team to learn and fully understand our mission and how each of us can contribute. We invite you to consider your own contributions, financially, physically, and through prayers, realizing that your actions will have an effect on our church and what our church looks like, acts like, and is like. In the next six weeks, we'll be reaching out to you by phone, in person, email, Facebook, almost any method known to man to answer your questions and invite you to become financially involved with your legacy of St. Luke's. Six weeks from now, April 10th, Palm Sunday, we'll be gathering our pledges together, offering them in faith to create a new church to be used for God's mission in our community. I want to thank each and every one of you in advance for allowing our team to visit, explain, and ask for your help in building our new church. In summary, if you forget everything I have said, I would like to have you remember these three things. We are all God's disciples his voices, his hands, his feet, to use for, for the use of God to use in his ministry. This new church is a tool to be used by us for God's ministry, and we need your help with prayers, financial involvement, and monetary gifts. Thank you all for helping our new church become a reality. Can we thank Larry? Thank you, Larry. You think I'm going to preach shorter? You don't know me well yet. Um, let's all stand together. And we are going to stand today in honor of the, the, the special occasion of the day through our gathering hymn. Through our gathering hymn. Today, friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Today, blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all of our sins whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin together in the presence of God and of one another. Have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the promise. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin. And he makes us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Our first hymn, Gather. God, we gather as your people.
May all be seated. Join your hearts and let us pray together. Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Transform us into the likeness of your Son, renewed our humanity, so that we might share in his divinity. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The reading is from Exodus 33. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all other people on the face of the earth? This is the word of the Lord. Please stand. Our gospel reading today comes from the 28th chapter of Matthew. This is also known as the Great Commission, when, when Jesus sends his apostles to go out and spread the gospel. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, the stone that sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know what you are looking for. For Jesus, who is crucified, he is not here, he is risen, just as he said, Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report get to the, gets to the governor, we will safely, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went into Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. This is the word of our Lord. Thank you. All right, choirs, come on up. Do your thing. There's already one up here.
Thank you all for that gift of music. Um, I'm going to start the children's sermon off in a little bit of a different way today. I need three people who are 70 years and older that would like to volunteer for something super cool. Three people, you have to be slightly extroverted to do this. Three people, seven, who might that be? Naomi, you know, if you're going to wear a, a, a jacket like that, you've got to be up front. <laughs> Okay, so that's one. Thank you for leading the charge. That's the hardest. Two other people. Thank you, Harriet. That's awesome. One other person? It's not showing off if the pastor invites you. It's being faithful. Anybody else? Um, oh, we have... Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. I saw some being, somebody being voluntold in the back. If, if you don't know my rule is for voluntelling, you have to do it. Just warn you for next time. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, okay, now kids come up for the kids sermon. Thank you. And you guys are facing this way, so you don't have to feel weird looking at them. Okay. Okay. Yep. Find find the space. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. One more time. Is the church the building? What is the church? Awesome. We have people right here. What I want to do for kids' church today is I want to tell stories. And I want everybody, I'm going to give you five seconds of, ten seconds of silence. Okay, everybody, young and old, ten seconds of silence. I want you to think in your head of a cool St. Luke story. Something that happened with you in the life of St. Luke Lutheran Church. Something that's important to you, a little short story that's, that's special to you. It, it may or may not have happened in this building. It may have happened while you were doing some sort of service piece outside of the building on behalf of St. Luke Lutheran Church. It might have happened when you ran into a neighbor on the street who is part of your church and that person did something kind for you because the church is the, is the people, not the building, but something that happened to you that was cool in your life here with the people of St. Luke Lutheran Church, okay? Ten seconds. I'm going to ask you to share the story too. That's why these three folks are up here. Okay. Will you guys start with us? Would you get three share a story of something that's important to you about life, the life of St. Luke, some special story? Who wants to go first? Naomi K. Okay. This is on now. Yes. And hold it right up here because it's kind of weak. Well, I remember when uh, Ted and I moved to Goodhue. And the first time we came to St. Luke's, Dean Kirkland came up to us and welcomed us so graciously. And he continued to do that and always set the stage for us feeling welcome here at St. Luke's. Thank you, Naomi. You can just pass it up. Um, <clears throat> we joined the church when our son was baptized uh, shortly before that, so that was fun. And then 14 months later, we had a daughter, and she was baptized here too. And baptism is so important wherever you are. It's just fun to think of that. We joined the church after we were married, and I guess one of the first things I remember about was being invited to a circle. We used to have Bible study and circle meetings, and these older ladies from the church were nice enough to invite somebody young as me to go along, and they were very nice to me, and I'll always remember that. We've had all our children baptized and confirmed here. Cool. Thanks, Kay. Okay, next generation. Who wants to tell a story of something cool that's happened to you, you've been a part of within the life of St. Luke Lutheran Church? Who'd like to do that? Yes. Okay, wait. I don't think I've called on you a bit. I think it's good. We're good. There you go. The Winter Wowza event. Winter Wowza event. Okay. The Broom Ball. Broom Ball. Yes, that was awesome. Relationship formation, exercise. Who else would I need? At least two more people. Who else would like to? Yes? Oh, good. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> well, you're young. We you got time. You can build some of those stories. Anybody else? Oh, 
Abby, would you? I don't, you have one? Can you tell them? You can look at that, the wall. I don't want to look at people. You want to look at the wall and tell it? All together. We're all together and we're all praying for God and Jesus. Awesome. And we're all together and all praying for God and Jesus. Cool. Thank you. Anybody? One more? Yeah. Okay. When we're singing. When we're singing. Yes. Thank you. So now let's, let's, let's imagine, because the church is the people, let's imagine that someday when you guys get older, you're sitting in these chairs. <laughs> we have to use our imagination very well, don't we? And, and you get to have grown a church and passed on a church that's cool and strong enough that all these stories, that you were able to give those stories to someone else, when you're sitting in these chairs, I wonder what people will be sitting here to continue those stories. Kind of makes you wonder, huh? That's your job. We're disciples. That's what we do. We're going to pray together, and here's what we're going to do. I want young to reach hands out to old. And a blessing. Old. Sorry. Seniors. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't. I do that all the time. Seniors to reach hands out to young. And we're going to pray together, okay? Uh, congregation can reach hand out too. This is a communal prayer. Lord, we thank you for the stories of faith that have been passed on from the time of Jesus all the way through now. Great grandparents, grandparents, parents, us here. We pray that, that this continuation of stories in your life might continue. That the gift of the church might be our gift, Lord, to continue to spread. Help us to live out this call faithfully to build anew. And may we especially keep in our minds blank faces of folks who are not yet part of our lives, but, but need to be. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Thank you guys. You guys were awesome. Today. You may go back to your seats. Oh yeah, second, yep, the second through six need to stay up for your song gift. I can I got it. I can.
Thank you all so much for that gift. That was awesome. The Lord be with you. Let's be together for a moment of prayer. Fathers, we gather multiple generations today and so many stories that um, have been a part of the ministry and work of this church. We, we pray that this work might continue through us, that we might continue being a place where multiple generations, where people of different stripes, whether they be philosophical, ideological, or even racial, can gather to be part of your kingdom, can identify as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, and move forward, Lord, and wonder who's not here but can be, so that we can welcome other stories into our midst. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. From Exodus today, if you heard, if you, if you heard there was a really awesome prayer that Moses offered to God. Lord, do not send us where your spirit is not. What a super holy prayer when it comes to discerning things and starting a discernment process. Lord, do not send us where your spirit is not. About a year and a half ago when my wife and I were discerning a call away from where we were living in Washington and to something else, we had to check up on churches and communities and whatnot to find out if there was a place in the world that we would fit. That is an awesome experience to have and a very scary experience to have as well. The, the, the bishop of the Southeast, well, no, it wasn't the bishop. It was somebody in the bishop's office. Barb Street threw a church and a name at it, St. Luke Lutheran Church in Goodhue, Minnesota. And she said, do you know where Goodhue is? And I said, let me get on my Google Maps. And I type in Goodhue. And honestly, nothing came up right away. She says by Red Wing, so I zoom into Red Wing, and she's like, go west. Oh, there it is, good Hugh. And I found it on my, on my Google map. And I thought, I've never lived in a rural community before. I, I don't know how this will work. So she said, okay, interview, and I did, and, and Christy did, and we kept going, and it kept turning out to be, to be a fit. One of the ways that, that we cyber-stalked you all at the same time I'm sure, I know the call committee cyber stalked me because they mentioned things from my Facebook profile, so I get to do it too. But one of the ways that, that we did it is we read, or I should say I read, past newsletter articles and um, annual meeting reports from St. Luke, Luke Church. I understand what kind of place is this, what kind of church is this, what do we do? One of the most impressive newsletter articles I've ever read was one of Pastor Regina's articles, and I think it was from 2017 or 18 as you all were discerning whether or not to build a new, how to follow that discernment process, what to think about, how to pray. And she had this piece from Exodus. Lord, do not send us where your spirit is not. Now I saw that and I thought, I thought two different things. I thought, wow, this, this church has some good problems. Every church has problems. Every family has problems. Every person has problems. This church had good problems. You were bursting at the seams. You were trying to figure out how to expand ministry in Goodhue, and as St. Luke as a whole, you were a growing church in the day and age when the majority of mainline Christian denominations, Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, all of them, are declining, not growing. I thought this church has a really cool problem to have. And so you prayed, Lord, do not send us where your spirit is not. Is building a new going to facilitate this growth of the gospel and of ministry in Goodhue? Now, going into a discernment process, too, also showed that you had a lot of maturity around the issue, that you know there are good reasons to build something new and that there are bad reasons to build something new. And again, I want to undergird the fact that we are not building a new church, right? Like, we can get that straight. This is an old church. Sorry, you're not old. I got to quit doing that. This is the same church that's building a new tool for ministry, a new building. But you learned that there were, there were good reasons for building and, and for bad reasons for building. And so you wanted, you prayed, do not send us where your spirit is not. I don't know all of the bad reasons for building, but I do know one. And I'm thinking of the story of the Tower of Babel. Have you ever heard that story in Genesis chapter 11? The building of the Tower of Babel. Genesis is weird. You can't get 11 chapters before the humans start acting crazy and building things they shouldn't build. 
So, so the, the human beings, God bless us, the, the, one, the one commandment of God that we've always followed to the T has been be fruitful and multiply. Like, we're good at that one. So starting in Genesis 1, the humans, you know, they, they, they're, they're, they're given the command, be fruitful and multiply. They do so by Genesis 11. They're this big, massive group of people who has subdued the earth in order to steward it, we know now, but they were kind of ruling it back then. And they decide, well, we're pretty cool. We, we need to build something that shows how cool we are. And in Genesis 11, they get together and they say, come, let us build ourselves a tower and let us make a name for ourselves. And so they build a tower that reaches up to heaven, signifying to the whole work earth, look how super cool we are. What happens to that tower a few verses later? It comes tumbling down because obviously that is a horrible reason to build, and that was not where the Spirit of God was. So what are good Spirit-led reasons for building a new church building? A really good church building, as well as any, any really good church ministry, actually helps people do the opposite of what the Tower of Babel did in Genesis 11. It helps us think of ourselves less rather than more. I want to repeat that. It helps us think of ourselves less rather than more. It helps a community look outward to others more than inward to themselves. If you notice, and I hope you notice this every Sunday, something you're going to get sick of me repeating this, the church continues to be one of the few places in America where when we walk in, we, sh- we literally shed other identities that we walk in with. That when we walk in, we don't walk in as male or female. We do, but not first. As male or female or as young or as old or as black or as white or as Republican or as Democrat, we walk in to identify ourselves underneath the symbols that we see up here, which is a cross. And we say, first and foremost, here, I'm not mom, I'm not dad, I'm not Eric, I'm not pastor. I'm a child of God, a brother and sister with all of those sitting next to me in Christ. And we carry that identity outside, and during the week, we forget it. And we lay it down for all the other ones because we're humans, and we do that. But then in church, we walk in again, and we throw it all away, and we put on our identities under the marks of our baptism, the cross and water. And we remember first, we are children of God, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. We think of ourselves less. We throw out our identities and take on that one. And Jesus takes hold of us more. When church buildings facilitate this weekly transformation, and you can think of it as a, a weekly transformation, a new, way, a new way weekly we put on different lenses to look at ourselves and our neighbors. When church buildings facilitate this transformation, really cool things happen. We're going to talk about a few of those things. And Larry doesn't want me to preach for 25 minutes. I could do a 20-minute PowerPoint presentation on, on the benefits of, of churches and communities gathering under identifying marks in Christ rather than what we normally carry and how that adds to more community cohesion, better community leadership, creative ways of doing things in the community. There's studies on this stuff, but I won't bore you with them now. But we've discerned that our new church building will help us do this transformative work more effectively, that we'll think of ourselves less and of Christ and our neighbors more. Now, why have we discerned that, that building a new building will, will do that? Larry mentioned a few, of those, a few of those things that we've discerned. There are three groups of people that we think about when building the new. The first one, of course, are those who are already here. We build a new for those who are already here. The second group of people are those who are not here but will be. Those whose future stories will have St. Luke as a chapter in those stories. The third group of people are those who will never be part of St. Luke Lutheran Church, who will never be members of St. Luke Lutheran Church, but who are part of our area and how we hope to bless through being who we are, knowing they might never be official humans attached with the name to St. Luke. But God bless us, they're part of our, our mission field. First, we've discerned our new building will better serve those who are already here. Discipleship is a journey from cradle to grave. And we've discerned that both our younger and senior generations will be served by having newer facilities. We're blessed to have every Sunday, just like we had up here today, the wisdom of the elder alongside the wonder of the child. This is a peanut butter and chocolate 
moment. They, they each just get better when you put them next to each other. And I don't have time to go through all of the studies, but you'd like Google studies on what happens when you put the wisdom of the elder and the wonder of the child, when you put multiple generations together on a regular basis, it's better for everybody. It's better for the community. Life expectancies rise. Mental health in kids and teens rise. If we can facilitate those kind of relationships even more in our, in our new building, we're not only expanding the gospel by word and preaching, but by relationships. We hope that, that, that new larger spaces, larger aisles, our lack of stairs will help facilities, facilitate these multi-generational relationships better. We also hope that a new building will help us disciple our next generation more effectively. As you heard in Matthew 28 today, one of the primary functions of the church is to go into the world and make disciples. I always tend to think of this, and tell me if this is you or not later too, I always tend to think of this as somebody I don't know, going to the world, discipling all nations. And then when I think about it more deeply, I realize if I can't disciple the people that live in the bedroom next to mine, I have no business discipling the people in the houses next to mine, right? It kind of starts at home. And if we can't start it at home, why are we going next, next door? Our new building, we hope, facilitates this, this ability we have as grandparents, great-grandparents, as parents, to help disciple those who live in the room down the hall, to share scripture with them, stories with them, relationship with them, talks about Jesus with them, to have a place from which to go and give dinner to people who don't have dinner with them. We're facilitating that relationship even more. Simple, simply logistically, a new space will provide... More space so my wife, Christy, and, and Amy Jensen don't have to yell over each other when they're teaching Sunday school, which will be awesome for both of their voices, I think. Um, when the time comes, it'll provide space for us to build holy, holy relationships with youth, and, and, and Ethan O'Reilly won't kick the soccer ball into the ceiling downstairs as, as often. That'll be better for my blood pressure. I need that. We're creating a little more breathing room a little more breathing room, also to invite others in. That leads me to my, next, to my next piece, that second group of people we're building for. Our new building is for those who are not here yet, but will be. Our new building should say that there is room for you. That, that There's a statistic that says if a church is over 80% full, people walk in, and it's, to them it's full. 80% looks 100%. And they're just... There's no room for you. Our new, new churches say, if you're not part of this, there's room for you. We have a new senior living facility being built just down the road, do we not? I can't imagine how many folks might be coming in and need accessible spaces and room for walkers and wheelchairs and things like that to worship. Our space should say, well, there, there's room for you here. If you walk in late... You don't have to do the walk of shame all the way up front. You can find yourself a spot in the back like everybody else wants to. There is room for you here. Finally, our new church, as I mentioned before, this might be the most important one, is for those who will never be official members of St. Luke Lutheran Church, but for whom we as a church long to be the body of Christ for anyway. Horrible to be the body of Christ simply for people that we know and love. As Jesus said, if you do that for the people you love, what good is it for you? Well, we want to be the body of Christ for people that we, 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 meet, we might only see once, maybe twice. Right now, Goodhue is a place where we only have one third place in town, essentially. It, not counting the bars. I mean, the bars are cool. I've been there. I'm, I don't know how far I'm going to go with this. I'm going to just stop there. <laughs> We, we only have one third place in town that, that's not a bar. It's that third place. It's called the third place. Um, you know where it is. I don't have to tell you where it is. Third places are, are super important for, for communities. In 1989, a sociologist named Ray Olenberg wrote a book called Celebrating the Third Place. And what he discovered is communities that have a lot of third places, which is not home, that's first. Work is second. Third is a place is the, is the non-home or not workplace. Communities that have ample third places have more community cohesion. They more creatively, when there's a need in the community, have little groups that get together where solutions bubble up. It's weird how space reflects and manufactures life. With more third places in a community, you have people of different groups 
who might not gather at work or home, but might gather in a neutral place to troubleshoot or to celebrate different challenges and blessings the town experiences and the whole community benefits. Well, our church should be that. As we build, we should be thinking this is another set of, however we use our rooms, third places for the community of good here. And I know, I know the hard part of this. At least I think I know the hard part of this. I'm a person who's moved a number of times. And I've left homes in Montana, and I've left homes in Japan, and I've left homes in Washington. And I understand that in the walls and in the structures of the places we live, there are, there are holy stories, are they not? Holy stories. And if you could, you'd take a part of that structure with you. I, I get that. I get that. In, in these walls here, there's holy stories. I don't know how often you've sat in worship, looked at the flickering candles, or looked at the, um, the, the picture of Jesus, or you guys over there looking at my side profile, whatever you look at during worship. I don't know how often you've done that and come to decisions or, or, or reflected on what God is doing with you or thought about a relationship and wondered, what am I going to do with this? How am I going to work this out. And, and maybe you've even left here with a solution or at least a step towards a solution. You've baptized children here. You've been confirmed or have confirmed your children here. You've been a youth who's run around and, and sat too tightly among the pews with your, with your friends. And you've, you've wrestled on the couches downstairs. Those are holy stories and this is a holy place. And I'm so happy this kind of place gave that to you. The holiest thing about a church is never the building. It just isn't. It's, it's the people. And although the building changes, the church is the same. The people go too. I remember Christ in, 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 in his uh, conversation, he's always accused of breaking laws on the Sabbath. Things get tricky when we see that the thing that the thing was built for, the church built for the people, is holier than the people, the Sabbath law is holier than the people it's meant to take, to take care of. As we change buildings, just know we're not changing churches. The church is you, the people. We thank God for, for this holy space. And, and look, this is going to take a while. It's not like this is happening anytime soon. For all the stories that have been holy and important here, we thank God that we're able to take a lot of things with us. Stained glass windows, baptismal fonts. I even, I, there's no way I'm leaving these things behind. I think I use these things more than anything else in this church. But churches always need reminders that the church is not the building. It's you and me. And we go to continue God's call to make disciples. We go because we feel this is where the Spirit is leading us. We go together and we go not just for ourselves. We go for those who are not here, not here yet and people we might only meet once. We go to continue to do the work of God. Amen. Please pray with me. In fact, as we pray, put your hand on, on as part of the building, a pew, something. Okay? We're going to pray, do a little prayer for our, our old building as we look towards our new building. I'm going to do this. Father, we thank you for those who've gone ahead of us that have built holy spaces and holy places in which we can sit and reflect, be inspired, be challenged, grow in relationship, form new relationships. We thank you how space serves this function. We thank you for this place, that it's because of this, place, this space we're able to think and dream and walk towards a new space. We thank you for this church, these people. And we pray, Lord, especially for those blank faces who don't have teachers yet, that we will meet, that we will serve, whose lives we'll be part of, because we're building a new. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. During, I got one announcement real quick. Thank you. During the hymn of the day, we have our special offering. Acolytes, you may come up. And... Um, everybody's welcome to come up for special offering if you saw in the bulletin. And there's no first, second, third. Just come up, adults and kids. Kind of as our, as our pledge and promise to be participate in this work of, of building anew. The offering will go to the Forward in Faith Fund.
we didn't think that through, did we? <laughs> thank you for your contributions. And I'd also like to thank, if you see anybody in the gray shirt as part of the building team or the capital campaign team, so if you get a chance, ask them questions today about the project and uh, thank them for their work. They've been, of course, uh, lending their time to that, that project. Together we confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose to heaven. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join together for the prayers of the church. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Transform us by your greatness, O God. Send us down the mountain to share joy with all people. Make us agents of change, confident that your hope will vanquish despair and your goodness will conquer evil. God of grace, the mountains and valleys sing your praise. Dazzle us with your presence in every landscape. Bluffs built by ancient glaciers, canyons carved by flowing rivers, flat horizons with uninterrupted views, and sands shaped by ocean tides. God of grace, hear our prayers. You love justice and establish equity. Strengthen leaders of local governments, community nonprofits, and grassroots campaigns. Bless them with gifts of integrity, creativity, and sound conscience. Build up safe and joyful communities where all people may thrive. God of grace, heal those who are in distress and illness. Give patience to those waiting for answers. Grant hope to those who have reached the limits of treatment. Give compassionate hearts to those who accompany loved ones through uncertainty, especially Jessica Heeman, Keith Brown, Kathy Nardinger, Dolly Mensick, Finley Boonsick, Cyril Noti, Dev Honicky, Roger Curdy, Rich and Sue Majeers, Judy Carpenter, Donald and Nancy Nord, Ben Hanel, Larry Reese, Jim Wilcox, Barb Mayer, Dan Hedin, Ken Bramer, the family of Barbara Buck, and the family of Dean Kirkland. God of grace. Lord, we come rejoicing in your grace, grateful that we grow in our faith as we worship and as we study your word, help us to do your work with our hands, serving people in need here and everywhere. Confident in your plans for us, grant our hearts and minds the confidence to commit to always giving generously of our time, talents, and treasure, but especially in our present capital campaign. For we know that everything we have is a gift from you. God of grace, today we shout hallelujah from the mountaintop. This week we enter the wilderness of Lent. Bless all who prepare and lead us in worship during this change of season. Pastors, deacons, musicians, and all who contribute to our worship life. God of grace. Blessed are they who listen to Christ's voice in his life and now rest with him. Transform us from glory into glory and give us your peace that we do not lose heart. God of grace. Since we have such great hope in, our, in your promises, O oh God, we lift these and all our prayers to you in confidence and faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Thank you. Today, may the peace of Christ be